I'm Roberto Rivella and welcome to episode 10 of Tailoring Talk. It's no secret that I love my food. I'm absolutely fascinated by all things culinary and the parallels between my world of custom tailoring and the world of fine dining are extraordinary. The details matter from the ingredients, in my case fabrics and materials, to the final product. I could have spoken to this week's guest for a lot longer and I'm sure there'll be a follow-up at some point. Those of you who are fans of MasterChef will recognise him instantly. Drew Baker, 2010 champion, a chef with an instinctive and encyclopedic knowledge of all things to do with spices. And now he's an award-winning charcuterie maker. Enjoy. I've said it before that every episode I feel like I can't do any better than the last time, but we're about to disprove that affirmation once again because I'm joined today by one of the leading lights of the UK food scene. Going from a career in sales to becoming MasterChef champion in 2010, this pursuit of a dream career in food then led to an amazing career working in some of our finest restaurants, including Le Gavroche and The Kitchen. His first book, Spice, was published in 2014, and the same year he opened his gastro pub, The Jolly Gardeners, in Earlsfield. More recently, he's teamed up with fellow chef Tom Whitaker to create award-winning charcuterie as co-owner of Tempest Foods. Drew Baker, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join me. How are you? Hey, Roberta. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, absolute pleasure to to be able to talk to you and to see you actually through the wondrous world of tech. Um, no, my pleasure entirely. I'm good. It's uh, I'd like to say the sun is shining. It's trying. Uh, it's not raining. So I'll take that as a win. So all good. Thank you. Yeah, it's warm. So we'll take that at least. Definitely. Definitely. Exactly. So um, you had a mixed start to the week. <laughs> Uh, at a tasting didn't you yeah i mean i've had a i've had a generally quite a mixed bag of a week i was uh in sheffield on tuesday i was in dorset on wednesday um judging for the great taste awards uh which is generally uh well it's always a pleasure and a joy but there is always there are always the occasional curveball thrown at me <laughs> and i i tasted some challenging things this time um but no, it's been uh, it's been a good week. It's been one of those varied ones. Now the world opening back up again, normality is resuming. So Tom and I have been in that unit producing charcuterie and nothing else for the best part of a year. Um, and I've really missed the kind of varied side of my working life. But um, luckily that's coming back now. So a mixed bag, as you say, this week, but just such a relief to be able to see people and do other stuff, um, which I love doing. I want to hear more about one of the curveballs that you had thrown at you this week. I mean, I know about it, but obviously people listening don't. We're, we're, we're blind judging, obviously, so we don't know what the product is. And obviously, you're cr- constructively critical where it needs be. But I did taste a product, which was a fermented tea leaf. Um, and I, I think the most challenging aspect was trying to describe it using words I would like to wor- use. Um, we leave it at the fact that I, I settled on vegetal and farmyard. You can you can put the two together and come up with whatever you will. But, um, you know, it's one of those things where people think, well, you're off judging food awards. What a lovely... And it is a lovely thing and it is a privilege. And 99 times out of 100, you taste amazing stuff. But... You know, every so often there's something that challenges your palate, whether it's a cultural thing. So, you know, there's stuff that we, that people outside of the UK would balk at, uh, Marmite, salt vinegar crisps. So a lot of it is sort of cultural influence. It's about what our palates are used to. So it's not per se, it's not good. It's just something that not all of us are necessarily used to. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess the ingredients I deal with in my line of work are mostly f- to do with fabric, which is touch, which, uh, you know, when I hear stories like that from you, I'm thinking, actually, thank God I don't need to put fabric in my mouth because um, I would definitely offend people if it wasn't to my liking. Yeah, um, if, you, if you had to test everything by chewing it, uh, the thought of chewing something like, I don't know, velour puts my nerves on edge, but I'm sure you don't do a massive amount of work with velour. Is that even uh, a fabric? no. Velvet's kind of coming back, though, uh, in a way. 
starting to get a lot more requests for velvet i think interestingly because because people have been working from home and they haven't been dressing smarter they've been wearing okay well sadly they've been wearing shorts and t-shirts and jogging bottoms and horrible things like that um but now they're starting to emerge sort of back into the world as it were and and events are starting to get booked and weddings and so on and people are kind of starting to think about things like black tie they are asking more about rather than kind of just doing things in a in the traditional way so take a take black tie for example it's traditionally a black suit with velvet lapel uh, satin lapels satin stripe down the side of the trousers and so on they're, they're people are, are kind of more interested in what twists we can actually do on the traditional yeah um so and that's where velvet's starting to come back in because people are starting to ask about you know the possibility of velvet jackets and all that sort of stuff so anyway look i still hold out hope and actually we are seeing it this month because it's been so busy that um that people are going to want to actually start dressing up again because we haven't really had that much excuse to over the last 12 months Oh, they've spent. Oh, people haven't spent any money on clothes for the last year, so they're probably going to say, "Right, let's let's get a new wardrobe." Or they've either put on a load of weight, or they've been super healthy and lost a load of weight and in need of a wardrobe. So I think this is like your prime time to find customers who've just got cash they haven't spent, and they've said, "Right, I've got years worth of clothing budget. Let's do. Let's get really nice stuff." Yeah, exactly. That's it. And uh, I mean, you know on your side of the business i mean people haven't been able to go to nicer restaurants and so on it's all been if they've been doing anything that's not home cooking it's been you know ordering through delivery and uber eats and that sort of stuff um so we went to uh i went with the client who's next rugby player the other day to the salt yard in good street yeah love um, that place yeah and it was just so nice i mean they they had a table reserved for us but i asked them if i could just sit at the bar because it always reminds me of being back in madrid yeah um and we just basically ordered as many small plates as we could absolutely stuffed by the time we were left but it was just nice to be in there just with people around the atmosphere and so on i can't believe people a lot of people at the start of the pandemic were saying that it you know it would almost be great if that sort of thing never happened again that it's not a necessary thing in life um, but... I think you've got to take the good of the bad. You know, I don't think necessarily, obviously some industries, yes, but I don't think everybody has to commute every day. You know, I think there's a balance to be struck. I mean, obviously when you're doing something where you've got to physically have a tangible product in your hands, you obviously have to be there. But I think there's a better balance to be found. You know, if you're able to work fewer hours, and I think generally, you know, it's that it's that it's all about balance right it's that slightly better work life balance because you you you're rushing to the school run you're then rushing to commute you're stuck in the mo- on the motorway or you're stuck on the tube and i think there's an opportunity here to say actually let's learn from it and actually take half a step back without compromising the quality of what we do and how we do it um but as we know and we've seen time and time again people have short memories and actually the learnings may well be lost in a matter of weeks so i hope yeah. not because i think while it was horrific obviously in, in many ways i think there were some positives i i always try and find the positives and stuff and we've got that amount of upheaval there's bound to be some positives right so uh, that was my line and i'm sticking to it anyway <laughs> yeah i mean definitely the positive for us was basically looking at what else people were doing right people are still eating food they're still drinking they're still wearing clothes thank god um so if they're not buying suits what else could we do and that's where we basically just really went for it at the workroom just kind of looking at the resource that we had and what other fabrics ingredients we could get our hands on to start creating little twists on smart casual clothing and so on and and you know we've just created all these lines that we never ever had before um when our normal business comes back it'll all bolt on and hopefully we'll be better than ever so i'm definitely looking back on it as a as a positive experience um and speaking of positive experiences i'm gonna if i can take you back 10 11 years now to um master chef yes uh, yeah 11 years wow Where's I mean, the time gone? <laughs> where's the time gone? <laughs> you know, in that time, I mean, you think about it, it has gone fast, but um, in that time I've gone from having a, a an 18-month-old to a near teenager and a second who's 10, and we've moved house, and I've 
change businesses. And so a lot has happened in that time. I mean, it's, uh, uh, we'll probably back up a little bit, but it was, you know, food was always an industry I I loved the idea of, but actually growing up and going through to university and to school and university, food was never really a, a proper career in inverted commas. You know, you, you kind of went and did something like accountancy or medicine or you know, whatever it was, but you kind of go through the motions and I did the degree and I kind of came out and I found a job and I just kind of tootled along. But I genuinely wanted to be in that world of food, but didn't know how I could do that. And actually the older I got and, and you know, kids come along and mortgages rack up and it becomes a kind of starts to become a pipe dream. And actually I was, I was on that kind of knife edge. Do I go and do one of these Cordon Bleu courses or do I just, you know, call it a day and think it was a pipe dream. And I was pretty much on that 50, 50 cusp at that point. Um, and then my wife convinced me to apply for MasterChef. Um, and I did it kind of fairly half-heartedly. It was, you know, what are the chances, right? Um, but it transpired that it was probably quite a good move in the end. Um, and yeah, that, that allowed me to kind of get catapulted into the world of food kind of professionally as opposed to just loving the idea of it and actually sort of working in food. And it's only once you're in there, you realise how many careers there are in food. You know, I thought you, you were either a chef or a food writer, and that's kind of it. But, but you know, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of jobs that I think you don't realise actually exist. Um, and I've done, I've done a few of them, actually. So, as you said, so my chef, yeah, still sort of juggling as many as possible. Um, had a catering company, Wrote the book, opened the restaurant, worked in some worked in kitchens before that. Um, got rid of the restaurant, pub restaurant. Um, still kept on doing some of the private catering, and you know, all the while doing brilliant things like getting to write for magazines. And I did two years. I spent in Croatia doing a TV series called Croatia's Finest. Um, all of these amazing things that you know I'd never been able to do. Um, but all the while, kind of aware that I needed to do the main thing so there's lots of bits and pieces I was doing and it was great but aware that I needed to do something and that was when Tom Whitaker who was runner up in 2011 who'd been living in Italy for a number of years and he had trained under some of the kind of modern day masters of Italian charcuterie um and I was kind of started learning the the technical side from Tom and writing a few recipes and this and that and 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 the, just kind of snowballed and we we said right well there appears to be a gap in British charcuterie uh inexplicably you know you've got we've got some of the best farmers in the world some of the best meat on earth yet the charcuterie didn't quite make the mark that not you know um the italians or the spanish or even the french were doing um or making well there are of course some fabulous producers but we thought there seemed to be a bit of a gap so we we went for it and that was in 2016 we launched the business in 2017 and then in 2018 we uh released the first sort of products or started production properly and that was uh what, three and a half years ago i mean that i went to year four now so i don't know where that time's gone um but you know it's one of those things where it's just keeping busy and finding different things and i think a lot of people are quite happy to focus solely on one thing um and we've done that with the charcuterie thing but i love the fact that i do have other options of looking at other things within that wonderful world of food yeah with, with inspiration food wise where did that come from we're both sons of indian mothers yeah and anyone who's the son of an indian mother you know your mum is the best cook in the world yeah my regret is that i didn't pay more attention to what my mum was doing when she had me in the kitchen helping her to you know wash up rolling pins and chopping boards and and so on um and she has a recipe book all handwritten that has was built up over years and years and years and you know I've always said to my sisters that you know you guys when unfortunately the day does come you guys can have everything I just want that damn recipe book because it's gold but I mean how how much of an influence was she on you in the kitchen or or did this passion for foods come from somewhere else or was it just always in well within you? actually growing up when I was very young, my mum was an awful cook. She didn't know how to cook. She'd never had to cook. <laughs> you know, when she married my father, they were living in Mexico. And so, you know, she wasn't doing the cooking. And then when we moved back to India after that, you know, she didn't cook. There were, there were people who did that. So 
Yeah, she was a, a, a dreadful cook. Um, and it was only later on when she started experimenting and sort of became self-taught that, that she then, you know, she became a brilliant cook. But I don't have, certainly don't have these memories like you do of sort of in the kitchen and wrote... I don't remember mum being in the kitchen and certainly not washing oh up. My so... God. I don't know where I got that from, that every Indian mum is absolutely amazing. Well, especially from... later on they seem to become... Well, my mum certainly did. You know, her, her cooking became incredible, but it certainly wasn't to start out with. So maybe she had this innate... I mean, my mum's a very artistic person. She paints, she does sculpture and ceramics and plays music and plays the piano and whatnot. So she's quite artistic. I'm really not, but maybe all of mine got channeled into cooking, uh, into food anyway. So um, I think it's... It was something I'd always been fascinated by. I mean, all of the men from my mum's side of the family all professed to being great cooks, and they were, but it would you know, be one of those things where it was like, right, the men are cooking, and every, the world had to grind to a halt while this happened, and everybody was on standby while this monumental feast and feat was accomplished and prepared. Um, and then on my dad's side, you know, there were some brilliant cooks, but completely different. It was kind of unbelievable desserts and cakes and baking, which I've never managed to get to grips with. I've never got the, I don't know what the patience to be a baker, um, ironically. Um, <laughs> but it was, there was always food. Food was always around, you know, it was, there was always family. There was always big groups. There was always gatherings. There was always food. There was always excitement behind it. And my uncle, who sadly died last year, he was one of these people that, would announce at sort of a ridiculous o'clock that he wanted something uber specific and then that was it. Nothing could get done until that was either cooked or found or bought or made or whatever. And um, I kind of respect that obsessiveness about something. Um, and the last time it happened, we were in, in India, in Bombay, and I remember it was mid-afternoon and he had announced he wanted this specific uh, chicken lollipops to go with pre-dinner drinks. And so people were sent out scouring the city to find these bloody things. And and it was one of those things where if that hadn't happened, it, that would have been the end of it, you know. Um, and I, I kind of applaud that to an extent. And, uh, you know, it, was, it wasn't it was an uncommon thing to happen. And so I, I suspect it was always something that in my peripheral or subconsciously was taking on that food is very important, however it manifests itself. And I guess I've just taken that and kind of used that as, the foundation from whatever's happened. Yeah. I would, had you always, um, uh, so obviously self-taught cooking and so on, when you cooked for family, so when you cooked for Eileen, for example, um, had you always presented things in a very chefy way? I don't think so. I mean, so when I, I, you know, I didn't really properly start cooking until I left university because throughout university we eat horrible stuff right chicken kievs that you throw in the oven and just oh. just rank stuff generally oh you were living it up i wasn't even doing that so i i was in a in a flat share with two other guys one was from yorkshire and the other one was from bedfordshire and the one from bedfordshire his dad ran i, I guess it was a potato farm because every time he'd go home he would bring back like a sack 50 kilo sack of potatoes yeah and then just dump them in a corner of this tiny kitchen. So anything we ate, it, potatoes had to be involved. Um, no arguments you know, from me my there. Wife, exactly, my wife being Spanish thinks potatoes are useless, although then I point out to her just how much the Spanish use potatoes. Yeah, you're looking confused as well. Yes. How much the Spanish use potatoes in their cooking. My God, when she makes a tortilla, the amount of slicing I have to do. Um and and the most that I was able to conjure up, because I barely knew how to switch a cooker on when I was in my late tw- teens, early 20s, um, was um, this thing where I would grill beef burgers and then just let the fat drip down onto potatoes that I had overboiled to the point where they were turning to powder. And then the fat from the beef burgers would sort of reconstitute the potato again and it would be this sort of beef burger flavored kind of mash you're looking at me like you want to throw up it actually tasted really nice and then you i just would present the beef burgers on top and everyone was happy to eat it (laughs) i like the fact that you've chosen to use the word present i suspect it was just more a case of just but uh no do you know the presentation thing no so post-university bought my first flat and actually if i'm brutally honest it was 
kind of I had my own flat and actually cooking impressive stuff was quite a good way to impress um people um <laughs> and you know it was it was a pretty success <laughs> it was a pretty successful gig uh and that that kind of gen- and then at the same time I was working a lot from home because the company I worked for had a London office part of my job was to find a London office so I'd watch a lot of cook daytime television and Gordon Ramsay had just started doing a lot of TV. You know, this back in yeah. the day, so we're talking like 99, 2000, so 20, 22 years ago. And I was just kind of blown away by this guy because he was kind of, he wasn't the kind of mould that you'd expect about chefs. He kind of spoke his mind and he swore a bit and he, he was just this, you know, obviously we, we'd all seen Marco, but for some reason I think I must have been too young when, when that had happened. But I just kind of resonated and, kind of opened my mind that food could be more, so much more. Uh, and after that, it was just kind of either free fall or free climb or whichever way you choose to look at it. Um, you know, became kind of more and more obsessive and spent all the money I earned on either ingredients or restaurants or cookbooks and just kind of fully immersed. And it all sounds so cliched because every year you watch MasterChef and everybody says exactly the same thing. Um, yeah. But it's it's true and you just kind of find yourself kind of slightly obsessed yeah. with it. And that was that was the start of it, really. And it's it's one of those things where, however much you know, I guess, much like your trade or your craft, yeah. however good you are and however much you know, you can always know more and be better. So there's no ceiling, there's no finite end, there's no goal, there's no end game. It's just this. It's as as open as you choose to want to make it. You know, you can get as good as you want. You can sit back and take it easy. You can come off at the next exit should you want to and that's kind of one of the appeals is that and you can always join rejoining if you want you know and I think that's one of the appeals is that there's so and it's so fast moving and dynamic and the world being a smaller place influences are becoming much more sort of prevalent so it's just generally quite a dynamic and exciting industry to be in yeah Ramsey that was I remember his first two biographies I absorbed those and from a tailoring point of view, I was working for a big international company and everything that we did was very fixed and very rigid, obviously, the way that they did things. And I couldn't break out of that. And that's why I was destined to go work for myself eventually so I could do things my own way. But um, I, you know, I, I just loved the way that he presented because like you said, he was just so different to everybody else and he just seemed to make all this kind of high-end dining a bit more accessible to ordinary people. Um, I I remember one of the first places that I took Carolina to when I was trying to impress her when we started dating uh, was Quo Vadis. Mm -hmm. One of my clients recommended it because I said, there's this girl that I've met and I want to impress her. Like I was going to take her to some place in Soho and he recommended this restaurant. I'd never experienced Michelin star food before. Um, and this was probably, in, I think it was in 2006, 2007. So we go to Quo Vadis and, and, you know, I ordered rabbit. She ordered something else. Uh, she's a complete carnivore. So it was probably a steak or something. But when the food turned up, I didn't understand because we looked at each other and I said, I, I mean, what is this, a starter? Is it an aperitif or something? I I mean, where's the actual food? And it was like, no, this is your main course. I'd never seen food presented in that way before. Yeah. Um, and it was great. But and then that's what got me really curious about fine dining and, and, and all this sort of stuff. But that's where my mind kind of boggles when I when, obviously MasterChef, the professionals, you kind of expect them to be at a certain standard. Mm-hmm. But you weren't a professional chef. You came from, I mean, nowhere you're in. Was it media sales? Yeah, I got that right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you go from media sales and having, obviously, cooking food as a passion or a hobby almost. Well, a hobby, but a passion. And then MasterChef, I mean, from maybe the first, second episode, the stuff that you were knocking out of the kitchen was absolutely incredible. But where where did that come from? Is there a lot that goes on behind the scenes that we as viewers just don't see in terms of practice, practice? No, well, that, do you know what? That is the beauty of MasterChef is that there is none of that. So I, I remember on day one, I was standing in the studio and I was slightly, you know, it was surreal. So I'd watched this show for years and John said, start cooking. And I just kind of stood there and he came over and he said, are you going to be cooking? And I said, what, you mean like now? 
and uh, I said, I thought you guys would like stop filming and we'd all get a few minutes to plan what we were doing. And he just pointed at, and there's this big clock with a red hand on it. And I'd already wasted six minutes and I hadn't even like started picking up any ingredients. And he was like, no, no, this is, this is the real deal. This is how it works. And so that was a bit of a shock because I assumed there'd be loads of stuff happening behind the scenes in terms of coaching or tuition, but there's none of it. So it's, it's as you see it. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's been so successful for so long is that the purity of the show has remained intact. There's no multi-million pound prize. There's no guarantee of anything. You know, the prize is that the, the trophy um, and I think that keeps the motivation quite pure. So you don't get people going, well, I'll, I'll have a go because there's, I want, I'm in it for the money. It's, and that has never changed. I think that motivation hasn't changed. I think that's what's kept it um, so true to itself. So, yeah, yeah, yeah there's no, none of it. You just, it's kind of sink or swim. You either kind of get better every stage because somebody else is. So you either keep up with them or you drop out. And that's kind of yeah. how it is. And then ultimately what happens is the ones who kind of improve fastest are the ones that progress and I was very fortunate to be in the final with two um, amazing people who are still really dear friends you know love those two guys to bits we speak all the time and and um, you know it I say it to this day any one of the three on any other given day could could have won it you know it was comp- there was no nothing in it really between the three of us um, and but then when you look at what you did in the final because you cooked for Alain Ducasse, right? Yes. At at the Dorchester. And, I mean, how was that for you, just kind of starting that final off, knowing that you were going to have to present the great man's food back to him, basically? Yeah, that was one of, probably still remains one of the most terrifying experiences of my life, cooking or otherwise. So walking into a room and seeing Alain Ducasse, and then him telling us that we're not only cooking for him, but cooking for five of his protégés. And uh, I, I just kind of, like, the three of us just kind of froze a little bit. And actually, the, the weight of expectation was, I mean, I'm, I'm, I can feel my systolic going through the roof just thinking about it now. And, you know, you're yeah, in the kitchen. People, people have to realise, I, I think the thing with MasterChef because we're sport by master chef the professionals now and very often when you talk to people about the show they confuse the two yeah because especially when you get into sort of six seven eight episodes into master chef people very suddenly the standard becomes so high that people often forget so you know again you've got three guys who aren't chefs you're not from that world you're not from a professional kitchen you're not from a michelin star kitchen and all of a sudden okay, you've had weeks leading up to this and you've been the best, been the best, been the best, but suddenly you get to the final, you're cooking for one of the greatest chefs ever there's ever been. Yep. Five of his protégés, they've got 30, 40 Michelin stars between them. Um, The pressure has to be immense. You know, if you're someone who's been in and had the pressure of... uh, of a professional kitchen for most of your life, maybe the pressure's that little bit less. But I think a mere mortal. I mean, my head would have blown off, and I probably would have shat myself. So, well, I think it wasn't um, wasn't far off that actually. Um, there was, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, we all got through it unscathed. Um, there's a hilarious story that off the back of that, where we were invited back after the show to eat at at the kind of chef's table there. So the three of us went with the producer Claire Nosworthy, and the four. And they basically brought out the whole menu. They brought out every starter, every main, every dessert for us to try and Alex um, started to feel a little un- unwell and he won't thank me for s- telling this, but he, what can only be described as a food whitey, he kind of just kind of lost it and um, had to be he nearly passed out. And I mean, this uh, only years later did Tim <laughs> who went out to check on him. And so Alex is sitting on the steps outside the Dorchester, which in itself is a bit of a, you know, your dignity is taking a kicking at that point. And the fact you've had to leave a three-star restaurant because you've overdone it. Not on the booze. It was just the richness of the food and probably the weight of the occasion. Yeah. But to this, only a few years ago did it. Did Tim kind of remind us, and actually he'd forgotten that he hadn't told us, was that Alex was sitting there in a slumped on the corner looking like a slightly well-dressed and well-heeled tramp. Um, Tim was standing next to him with his hand on his shoulder and, 
a woman came up and put her hand on his shoulder and said, is he all right? And t- Tim said, "She's yeah, he, he's just overdone it. And off she left, uh, Helen Mirren, that was at the time. And so wow. uh, Tim, he said it, he said, Alex, do you remember that time Helen Mirren wanted to check on you? And he was like, what? He said, oh, didn't I tell you? Oh, that was that time at Ducasse when he passed out after lunch. Um, so obviously he had had a delayed reaction to the to the enormity of the event. But yeah, I mean, very few people get to cook in that situation. And I think the problem is, is that at the time you're so panicked and so blinkered trying to do what you're doing. I wish with hindsight I'd had, you know, been able to take it in a bit better. But, you know, you're up against it time-wise. It's a lot to do, a lot to do. Um, you know, these are designed to put, amateur cooks in a professional environment so um would i do it again if i knew i'd win it again i guess <laughs> yeah i mean you uh, this is the the kind of entrepreneurial side of you comes in because you win master chef you must have had so many offers to go off and run professional kitchens for people because obviously that's the greatest stage the greatest show showcase yeah. for a budding young chef but you didn't do that straight away you held off yeah I, I think the biggest mistake and i've seen it happen time and time and time again finalists will take a head chef and the chef head chef role and will be done and out within four or five weeks max because we aren't chefs we're cooks right so yeah i i, I was probably older than the norm i was 32 at the time um and I, I knew that I didn't have the ability. So what I did know is that, okay, I can cook, but I'm not a chef. So I just rang all the chefs that I kind of admired the most and said, look, can I come and work, do a stage, spend some time learning? So I, a Tom Kitchen in Edinburgh rang him and he let me come and work there for a bit. Uh, Michelle at the Gavroche let me, uh, Atul at Benares, Ellen DeRose at the Connaught. And they were like, yeah, you know, fine. And all, these are all the people I'd met during the show. So it wasn't like it was a complete cold call that I'd cooked for them at one point or another. And they thought, yeah, why not? He, he, he probably, how, how bad can it go? But, you know, I had to learn from the, the very basics. How do you make the best stock to make the best sauce? Oh, well, I didn't have to, but that's what I chose to do. How do you learn your butchery? How do you learn your fish skills, your knife skills, the, the absolute fundamentals that you need to understand. And that was what I wanted to do was learn the difference between a mirepoix and a brunoise and the difference between the, you know, how do you clarify stocks and how do you make contomics and how, you know, how, how, how. Um, And that was what I chose to do. And when I felt I had got enough experience, I launched, I did the kind of the catering side of things and then the sort of pub restaurant. But, you know, all the way through it, what I loved doing was using spices in ways that weren't normally used. And that formed the kind of backbone. Yeah, that's the thing with you. So Artif Gafar, who I had on, I think it was episode five of the first season, and I, I called him the sound doctor. He's the owner of Zebra Home Cinema. He he takes, again, a very chefy approach to, um, you know, finding a space within your home and making it the best sound experience that possibly can. He doesn't just sell speakers. He, he really looks at all the aesthetics, and it's absolutely fascinating anyway. Um, and I, I dubbed him the sound doctor. And, you know, if I had to give you a superhero name, it would be the spice doctor or the master of spice or something. Because yeah, I can't just... be the spice doctor. That's Anjum. She's already the spice doctor. So oh, she's God, got that. Yeah, that's right. She is. <laughs> yeah. And um, if you ever hear this, I'm honoured, but um, you, she probably won't. Um, but um, but yeah, she is the spice doctor. OK, yeah. so I need to find something else for you. But yeah, but you, you just are. And... That must, I mean, there must have been a lot of experimenting going on for you to kind of get to that sort of level. Do, do you know, it's it's a funny one because I um, I can kind of almost, it sounds like a slightly nutty thing to say, but kind of visualise flavours like and the interplay. So quite often when I think about a dish, I can pretty much know exactly what it's going to taste like, however many components are going into it. And so... That's why I kind of love looking cooking with spices. It's because you've got all of these sort of hints and little nuances and notes that aren't kind of really obvious, but using them in in different ways. And and that's how I've always cooked. And actually, that's how Tempus came. The recipe for Tempus come about. So I approach a new product or any of our products no differently than I would do a new dish. Um, the spicing, the and you think of it as if you go back to the music analogy, your sort of base notes and your higher notes and the kind of infill yeah. and the background and the foreground and, and um or a painting or a visual or any other sensory 
experience you know it's it's how do you add richness and depth to that and layer those flavors into it and the way we do our charcuterie is is no different so uh, designing a new copper or a new salami or whatever is no different to coming up with a new dish with a sauce on it to be honest it's it's do all of those components work together and how do you make them rich and intricate and I guess that has been the, the theme throughout everything I've done, including the book and the pub and the cake, whatever, has been using those, using spices. And um, admittedly, every year my food becomes more and more and more simple. And I think that's a case of confidence. I suspect in your uh, profession, you'd be the same. You'd probably try a lot harder. And actually, the more experience and the better you get, you probably find do yourself doing less and less, but doing it better. And actually, you end up with something. I guess that's why classics are classics, because they are simple. There's nothing superfluous. There's no unnecessary garnish or no, uh, you know. And I think that only comes with experience. So it, it takes yeah. a long time to do less confidently. Yeah. yeah. And um, so... You and Tom working, so Tom Whitaker, who was runner up in 2011. Yeah. How did you guys meet? Because that wasn't through MasterChef, was it? Was that just on the normal chef circuit or did you work, uh, to work together at some point? So I spoke to him through MasterChef. Like they'll say, they'll kind of put alumni in touch with, with kind of, you know, current con- contestants just to kind of uh, talk them off the ledge every so often. <laughs> Uh, but actually, we happened to be sharing a kitchen at the time. So we were sharing a kitchen in South West London. And I'd be there prepping, you know, thousands of canapes for yet another event. And he'd be there butchering down like a 200 kilo pig, which was far more exciting. And so slowly but surely, I started getting more involved with what he was doing. And we started sort of... Um, experimenting with different breeds and ages of animals and different products and different spice blends and you know i was just cutting my teeth learning the the technical side from tom so with you know with charcuterie what you actually do to the product is only about 50 percent of it what you do to the environmentals and the the climate it's in is about 50 percent. so it's not only understanding the product it's understanding humidity temperature airflow all of those kind of things so all of this i'd sort of been learning from tom um uh, and we we just kind of started doing more and more of it, and he just said at one point, "Do you reckon we should try and do this properly?" Um, so we raised some money, and uh, I said, "Look, if we do this, we we need to be very quickly the kind of best producer in the country because before really to be taken seriously, I want us to be competing with the Spanish, the Italians, um, and that's always been." I said, "You know, there's we don't want to be the best British producer; we want to be one of the best producers." who happens to be British. That, that's kind of always been what we've wanted to do. And that's the thing when it comes to charcuterie, because immediately when I... Um, so when I, I put my first order in with Tempus and my wife saw that I put my first order in with Tempus for British... I said to her, it's British charcuterie. She was looking at me and she's like, why are you wasting your money on that? Why didn't you just order Spanish stuff? Because it's the best... Um, and I said, well, it's always nice to try something new. And uh, the first thing we tried out of the box was the spreadable salami, the porcini and... Uh, and black truffle. Tru- black truffle yeah, and porcini. The yeah, black the spreadable. Porcini. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and she just fell in love with it straight away. I've actually, I mean, I, it's gone now. It didn't last very long because I <laughs> stopped spreading it on sourdough and stuff as you recommend and I actually ended up just squeezing the thing out of its skin and just it just went straight down my throat like a fruit uh, that sounded rude um but it's amazing <laughs> so um I will put links in the um episode description uh god I've had a few weeks off from podcast and I can't remember what things are called anyway there will be uh, ways for you lot to get your hands on stuff um but you've done a really good job, basically, is what I was saying. <laughs> You're great. Well, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It was, um, you know, so we, you. what we're trying to do is a core range. And I, I think, you know, too many producers, irrespective of sector, try to do too many different things. Like, it's no different to if you went to a a clothes store, a high-end clothes store, or you went to a high-end restaurant, and the menu was immensely long, or the list, the product list was hugely long, the catalogue was massive. You think, well, how can there be enough care and attention on any one product if there's such a wide range? And actually, to me, it, it smacks of a lack of confidence. So actually, I love nothing more than going to a restaurant and the menu being like that long, all, like, yeah. th- all three courses. 
to me that shows real confidence on the part of the chef it shows real confidence um in the ingredients you know that you know the other thing with the long list of dishes you think well how is everything fresh if there's this much on here so we've we've paired you know we launched with like 14 products we've now paired that back probably to seven uh, and then what we'll do is we'll always have a couple in development because tom and i both need that r d that innovation element just to keep it exciting and fresh so you know, we've always got two or three products in development and only if it's really exceptional will we release it. So I'd say one in 10 might see the light of day. Um, and I think that's that's the kind of what we're looking at is that have that confidence in the core product range and then have a bit of innovation. But don't have 30 or 40 product lines. Um so that's you know how we've approached it, and so far so good. We we are now looking at expanding. We're looking at a new site. We're looking at growing the business. It's um, it's got to that point where we can't keep up with demand. So, you know, just when you think four years in, it's time to rest on your laurels. It really isn't. It's time to go again, and so, so kind of deep breaths and and go out and do it all over again. Yeah, but that's part partly that's the personality type, isn't it? Like it, it is still. I think you're actually right. And Tom and I joke, you know, in the first year of, of Tempest's life in 2018 at the inaugural British Charcuterie Awards, we won overall best producer in the country. And the following year, we won uh, single best product in the country alongside Master Charcuterie of Great Britain. And we won, you know, all of pretty much all the products have won gold medals at all the awards. But Tom and I have never once, we had, we've had one pint to celebrate. But I remember ringing him up once and we had like, eight gold and a silver and the first thing I said was what can we do about that silver it wasn't oh great we've got so we're our own harshest critics um he and I used to fall out not fall out we used to argue a lot because because we care you know and I'd I'd get really upset about the fundamental about the humidity on something and and he'd understand but you know he's like it's, it's not his fault or it's not my and we used to clash a lot a lot so how we got through the first two or three years intact i don't know but actually what we found is a way of harnessing that because it's ultimately a positive energy but at times it can really kind of nearly blow up but we've just had to find ways of managing that and i think as long as we have close blow close to blowing up it means that we're all still vested in the business yeah um it's when we kind of think man well this isn't that great but you know what bugger it doesn't really matter that's when i think the problems are uh, the cracks start to appear yeah borrow a slogan from that phone manufacturer that i can't remember the name of but never settle i think is the is that key phrase to describe those types of situations it's the reason why you have these blow-ups and we have it as well it's i work with my wife which adds that extra layer of of wow (laughs) you need to know where you know your kind of husband wife boundaries are end and where your business ones begin and then when the husband wife ones kick back in very often actually there aren't any it all just meshes together and it yeah but also how to delineate Um, and not bring issues from one aspect of that into the other one i guess that's the the discipline is how do you not take negative vibes from whether it's the the familiar life or the professional life and cross over into the other one and I, i think that's the discipline and that's where i think most people really struggle Yeah, I think, you know, for us, it's impossible and it happens almost on a daily basis. But I think we've uh, come to an understanding that it's going to happen, but we just make sure that when it does, that we deal with it immediately. Yeah, don't let it fester. Exactly. It's it's not left to fester. And very often I am the one that needs to apologise. I really should not be going down this conversation line because my wife listens to this thing. Um, so there's going to be trouble in about two or three weeks time. <laughs> if I go missing everybody you know why um, so uh, when you talk about products in development and it, so how are you kind of set up over there have you got almost like a room or lab or something where you guys are wearing your white coats and dreaming yeah. up all of you yeah, yeah, we've got a test kitchen and we've got all of our spices and all of our ingredients in there. Or Tom will have read about some ridiculously obscure product from somewhere from like 300 years ago and go, you know what, that sounds pretty cool. Let's try and do that. Or I'll have thought of a, a, a flavor profile that I think would work with something. And, you know, it could be come from anywhere. It could literally be any kind of type of inspiration. Um, it could be 
tasting mezcal and saying, actually, do you know what? It'd be quite cool using a mezcal rub instead of a red wine rub on this, and let's try and use flavours that would echo that. And um, So, yeah, and I, I think that the creative side of it needs that, that side of things. If we kind of scrapped all that and just said, right, these are the seven we're going to continue to do, I think we just get very bored very quickly. So... You know, we'll go and mooch around and it could be on a Saturday. You, we've been developing with some other meats at the moment, doing some work at the moment, um, which could be a massively exciting project, which I can't say anything about now, but it's not pork and it's not beef. So it opens up a huge sector of the market that may not yeah. otherwise. Um, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's something that could be like genuinely revolutionary uh, in the way that, that stuff like that that kind of happens so it's um it, it's it's all go and it's just a case of keeping as many <laughs> plates spinning and breaking as few as possible when you're when you're that busy and you're that involved intense um and you, you know you're juggling so many balls all the time how do you obviously it's also you know when you've got creative brains which is what we both have it's really important to still try and create space for yourself um otherwise you can just find that you're doing things for the sake of it how how do you do that and what do you do just to kind of sometimes create some space between you and the business and what you're doing you know for yourself your family and so on well actually that's something i'm no good at i i really struggle with that and actually it's a really valid question and especially now i'm genuinely struggling a lot at the minute because you know you Working all week, obviously, and it never stops because we're a small business and if somebody's ordered some salami and it hasn't come through, it comes through to my phone or Tom's phone and we kind of deal with it. It could be Saturday at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It could be Monday at 9 o'clock in the evening. But we're both, we're both parents. So when you leave the office, you've left the office, which still comes with you, but then you've got to get kids from school to cricket to football to swimming. You've got you've got to cook and feed them, um, and then you've still got to try and find time for trying to manage some form of exercise or fitting in a social life. And actually, it as you said, it all just feels like you're going through the motions. And so, what I need to try and do, and what I'm trying to do now, is where can I get ten percent out of that day, and just for myself. And it sounds kind of selfish, but I think you need that headspace. I I've, I've felt. Um, I think as a parent, especially, you start to think it's selfish because you could be doing something for someone else. But I think um, that the awareness is stage one of it, and I think the second one is trying to find find room to to create that extra ten five to ten percent um, space. We've both learned the hard way what happens if you don't. You know, for working sustained periods like that, it it doesn't ever end well. So I think it's, uh, and I think it's it's just part and parcel of that, whether it's that, you know, men I think are worse at it because generally we're worse th- at, at than talking at stuff, about yeah. stuff. And I think whether it's that, that historical, that hideous phase of man up, you know, and then you think, oh, you know, this is a bit feeble and a bit pathetic. And, you know, all of that wrapped up in with sort of mental health. And it, it, it's pretty toxic, actually. And I think it's starting to happen on a bigger context. I mean, hospitality is probably the worst for it you look at chefs and you look at people in that industry and it's not talked about because it's quite a kind of volatile quite aggressive environment or it can be and i think it's become more so than it has to be and and actually i think last year people have realized that actually i don't need to work like this and a lot of chefs they're claiming 10 percent of people are probably not going to go back to hospitality because it's a hard grind and there are easier ways of making a living so you know, again, one of the good things that people might say, well, let's try and make it a slightly better environment. Let's not question why we can't find a head chef to work 80 hours a week at 25 grand a year and actually fix bigger issues. So, um, yeah, that we've kind of gone off piece a little bit here. But I think all of those things are all kind of linked together. Um, and I think it all goes down to having that headspace for oneself, actually, so that it yeah. doesn't snowball into some of that other stuff. No, absolutely. And self-care isn't, I know, I know what you mean. It can actually feel quite selfish. So for me, the thing that I found in the last few years, I mean, not least because I actually needed to lose a lot of weight, um, is cycling. It was one thing I took up, but I do that very early in the morning. So I'll leave at six. Saturdays, I won't be back until about 10 a.m. And, and that does, I do feel guilty over that because Saturdays, now we're coming into cycle season now 
so Saturday is now for the foreseeable. I'm not going to be there to have breakfast with Carolina. Um, she gets Sunday, but Saturdays is mine. I feel terribly guilty over that. But if I don't do it, my my health starts to deteriorate. My weight goes up. My mental health goes all over the place. Um, and and then I'm no good to her. So, so yeah, I, yeah, I absolutely. Kind of, have to keep reminding myself of that that if I'm not looking after myself I'm not looking after someone uh, someone very wise told me uh, they pointed out that when you when you get on a plane and you're about to take off and they give you the emergency briefing and they tell you you know in the event of an emergency or sudden loss in cabin pressure masks will drop down fit your own mask before helping others because yeah if you don't you're not going to be, you'll be passed out. You can't help anyone yeah, else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah. So that always now sticks with me. And so I just keep reminding myself of that little lesson. And, uh, and, and you know, when I just feel myself kind of, I mean, especially recently, because we've, like you, just been involved in so many new projects. And I've got a list of another 25, 30 things that I need to sort of look at, experiment with, and decide whether we're going to go down all these different roads as well. Um, but I, I just have to keep reminding myself of that. I think it's so important. And like you say, as men, we're, I think we are marginally worse at it, um, than our, our superior female ca- counterparts. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, look, I, um, I am not going to probe you any further on the big secret project at Tempest, <laughs> but it's really, really exciting. Listen, you'll be the first to know. We'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah, uh, thank you. I feel so privileged. Um, uh, Good luck with that and um, good luck with everything else that you've got going on. I'd love to have you back later in the year, maybe when Big New Not Beef Not Pork has launched and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's absolutely. Once once we've kind of got back to a bit more normality as well, I'd love to actually like just come and shadow you for a day and just be like a free personal assistant just to kind of watch what you do. It'd be so fascinating. Uh, from my are you saying that this. for one of those days that I'm doing food judging, just out of curiosity? Would, it, would that be one of the days you'd be volunteering? <laughs> um, well, I'm not going to say no if you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I could take the hit from you if anyone approaches you with any sort of lapsang, funny, you know, herbal tea nonsense. <laughs> Trust me, that's one hit. You'll take it once and then you wouldn't be seen for dust. But... Uh, <laughs> That, that, that really uh, yeah, but do you know what? Right? Any time you want to come down and see how charcuterie's made, you're more than welcome. Come down, spend a day with us, get in the butchery, cut some stuff up, you know, just see how it goes. Because ultimately, you know, you and I do the same thing. We take very basic ingredients and then we turn them into luxury products, which very discerning people spend a lot of money on. So the fact that you eat one and wear the other is neither here nor there. It's ultimately the same start and end point. So, um, yeah. yeah, come down, have a look, see what you think. I'd love to. Thank you. And everyone listening, um, you can find all of this award-winning, amazing charcuterie at Tempest Foods. Um, I will put the link in the show notes. Um, Drew, um, I will also just link to your social media accounts and stuff. So yeah, people please do. To find you if they're not already following Absolutely. you. Why not? Um, go just pay attention to what this guy's doing. It, 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 he's just he and Tom, I should I should not leave Tom out of this, are both just doing incredible things and turning kind of everyday stuff into things that are extraordinary. And I take my hat off to you. You inspire me so often. So and that's very kind, Roberta. Pleasure. Thank you, dude. My pleasure. Genuinely a pleasure. Anytime. Brilliant. Right. Well, I look forward to seeing you soon. And uh, thanks again for your time today. It's been an thanks, absolute Roberto. pleasure. Thanks, Roberto. Cheers. And send us a uh, drop us an email or a text and I'll sort you out some more of that truffle spread or salami. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> See you soon. Cheers. Bye. I hope you enjoyed spending time with Druve as much as I did. If your mouth has been watering, I strongly recommend trying Druve and Tom's amazing products. You can order online now at tempestfoods.com. That's T E M pusfoods.com please remember to review recommend and share the show if you're enjoying it this episode particularly is a great one to share with your parents grandparents siblings friends your boss your boss's boss 
Instead of blankly scrolling through Netflix titles, scroll through your contacts app instead and help get the word out there about this podcast. From Oklahoma to Norwich, I've got some amazing guests lined up over the coming weeks, so make sure you hit that subscribe button so you do not miss an episode. Remember to connect with me on social, just search Roberto Rivilla, or check the links in the show notes. That's it for another week. Catch you on the next one.